and we're looking forward to a wonderful, thought-provoking, fun afternoon with Elliott Land Action. I'm the, Allison Wickens. I'm the Director of Education here, and 2009 is the year of Lincoln. And all throughout the city and all throughout the country, there's so many wonderful celebrations of Abraham Lincoln's life, and the Postal Museum is proud to be a part of that. Now I'd like to introduce our museum senior fellow teleturator, Cheryl Hook. Sunman Lecture is a big full public public program of the year and I'm just thrilled that we have great turnout like we do every year. Uh, how many here are staff collectors? Oh, I didn't quite staff <coughs> And all the rest are potential staff collectors. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. And how many of you belong to a staff club? Great. I think it's one of the most fun ways to experience your hobby. So if you don't belong to a staff club and you want to, during this little social hour, just introduce yourself to anyone, because you just saw two-thirds of the people in this room belong to a club that can help you get started on that. But we happen to have one club here that you can actually go talk to uh, members and join today, and they call themselves Esper. It's the Ebony Society, and it's collectors who collect African-American stamps or uh, topics related to African-Americans. And we happen to have, fortunately, the president and vice president editor here. Manny is at the table. At the table, we just want to see him. And Don, right here. The Sunman Lecture is named for Maynard Sunman. He was a philatelic entrepreneur and a passionate collaboratist who advocated the community of joys of collecting. And this lecture series is sponsored by his two sons. Uh, Don and David Sunman. John Sunman, and uh, thank you for coming today uh, to the lecture series that uh, my brother and I uh, sponsor in my father's honor. My dad died just about a year and a half ago at 91, just turned 92 years old, and he loved stamps his whole life. He was a little boy, started collecting, and then uh, that's what he wanted to do when he got out of high school, and so he had a stamp business and then went into the service for World War II, and then after the war started it up again with my mom. And he just loved his life in stamps and then made his coins. And then uh, my brother runs my father's company now, the Holton Coin Company. My father bought Mystic Stamp Company that I run. And so even at 91 years old, my father is going to the office. Uh, uh, to help out, and uh, he would read Lynn Stamp News and call me up for ideas for ads and things like that. And he'd be so excited about it. So he would be really proud that you would take your time to come in here and uh, see the museum and listen to that with So thank you for coming. It's my pleasure to introduce Elliot Landau. Elliot's a lawyer from Illinois with beliefs in social justice. No surprise that he collects Lincoln been collecting it his entire adult life. That's not the only thing he collects, but it is one of his great specialties. And he has exhibited stamp collections of Lincoln stamps, winning gold awards all through the United States for a long time. This is one of his newer exhibits on exhibit here. And this is the first time, in addition to stamps and covers, that he's added documents and photographs, various kinds of ephemeral artifacts so that you really get a rich, full story in context in a new way. And I think he just did a masterful full job. Um, it is truly a lifetime collection and a lifetime commitment to telling the story. In your program, you're going to see his biography. You know what? We can't even fit it all in there. He's also a board member of the Military History Society, president of the US Registered Male Study Group. I first met him over 35 years ago, we served on the uh, Chicago Philatelic Society uh, show committee together and um, when I when I just did it forward for the one myself. This uh, I think the exciting thing about this exhibit is if you're a stamp collector, you just kind of stand there in awe. And if you're not a stamp collector, you're just mesmerized anyhow. It's able to bridge across all kinds of um, viewers. And that's the reason uh, it just jumped out is, is the kind of exhibit story we wanted this year. Elliot is known in the hobby to many as Mr. Lincoln. So there's no one else who could have told the story that he can. Like the Wild Metal Lincoln. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you, Cheryl. I find it so intriguing that with all of the artifacts that are in this exhibit, she chose an artifact to discuss them with you. Uh, I would like to take just one moment because he slipped in a little bit late, but Manny, would you please stand up? Come on, Manny. Manny Gilliard, come on. <laughs> Manny is the president of the Ebony Society, and we're very honored that he and so many other members of the Society could join us today. <laughs> I am also a member, as is Cheryl. Uh, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is very nice to have you here. I hope that we will have something that will teach, amuse, and entertain you. And we do have a few children, and I think that we have things that will interest and teach them as well. This exhibition and, lec and lecture is hosted by the National Postal Museum of the Smithsonian Institution. This is also part of the National Lincoln Bicentennial Commission official sponsored events. Uh, I'm so glad the Sunmans were letting us share it with them. And it is also the last official event and national observance for Black History Month. You'll see why shortly. Uh, the, um, it's the 200th anniversary of President Lincoln's birth on February 12, 1809. I actually want to extend my personal thanks to the Sunman Brothers for so generously endowing the series of lectures, but I can't, with, I can't say it without a personal reminiscence, because when I was a youngster new in the hobby, their father, before it was a coin company, ran Littleton Stamp Company, and a good portion of my early collecting efforts before it was Lincoln in particular, was thanks to Maynard Sunman, a very kindly gentleman who always had the time to help a new youngster. And that's one of the things we try to do in philately, is to help each other. We are honored by the presence of some people who are here from Congress, the U.S. Postal Service, and the American Philatelic Society, and my lunch mates from the U.S. Philatelic Classic Society. Uh, we, are, we welcome the many members of ESPER, the Ebony Society of Philatelic Events and Reflections. This is a chapter of the American Philatelic Society whose members study and collect philatelic material of all nations teaching about the black experience in America. Uh, my deepest thanks to the National Postal Museum, and especially to Cheryl, uh, like me, a fellow Esper member, as I said, for choosing this exhibit and subject that we share with you today. A few more comments. While I hope to please you all, I'm looking at so many of you, and I sort of feel like poor Tom. You see, Lincoln was in Danville, Illinois following a hard day of trial. So he stepped over to the restaurant to get himself some dinner. And all of a sudden he hears this big ruckus outside. And he walks out and there he sees poor Tom. Poor Tom is covered in hot gooey tar and chicken feathers. And he's being ridden out of town on a split rail from a fence. Lincoln looks up at him and he said, you know, I'd always wondered what that'd feel like. Tom looks back at him and says, oh, Mr. Lincoln, well, you know, if it wasn't for the honor of the thing, I'd rather walk. <laughs> for those of you who are here for the history instead of the philately, the word philately is the formal name for the love of collecting stamps and their uses, especially on envelopes, which we call covers, because originally they covered the letter inside, and the name has stuck with them. There are many different ways to be involved in philately. There are those who collect a favorite topic, dinosaurs, birds, flowers, baseball, fairy tales, uh, or a place, or a country. There are those who join clubs and societies 
to share the enjoyment and information. Now, some people practice it as a solo hobby, but believe me, it's best shared as a social hobby, exchanging and comparing and learning from each other. Many share by creating exhibits to show at local and national stamp shows throughout the entire country. There are many categories of exhibiting. Our focus today will be on one of the newest recognized and approved categories called display class. Display class combines the exhibiting of philately relating to a particular subject with other historical or related material that tells a story. The first major exhibit to be recognized this way was Kenneth Cutts, Letters of Gold, and he told the story of the California Gold Rush. Probably the, one of the very best of the display class exhibits of all time was Take a Ride on the Hindenburg. This was the story of the making, the flights, and the tragic end of a German airship created by and told by our own Cheryl Gantz. It's not that difficult. My wife, Eileen Landau, created an exhibit called The Art of the Kimono. Turned out it was very successful. The exhibit that we're going to look at today combines letters, documents, and artifacts. Uh, the museum likes to call them ephemera. I think it's better to say what they are. Uh, and other philatelic material, with covers and other philatelic material. And it's to tell the story of our nation's very sad involvement with the enslaving of men, women, and children who were kidnapped and forcefully brought here from Africa, the conflicts between those who wanted to expand and those who wanted to abolish slavery, the rise of Abraham Lincoln, who would become the instrument of its end, and the bloody Civil War, which preserved the Union at great cost of lives while forcing an end to slavery and letting free black men honorably fight as soldiers, and ending with the last great casualty of that war, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. This presentation gives you only selected highlights. This is, these are extracts from a 160-page exhibit, which is on display just out in front of Ben Franklin. Uh, the other two exhibits are just behind him. Uh, one of those is the earliest usages of the 1909 stamps celebrating the centennial of his birth, and we're showing it and sharing it with you here today because it's the centennial of the centennial. The other one is virtually, mo it's almost all the stamps issued by the United States honoring Lincoln from 1866 through February 9th of this year. Uh, I was one of the co-designers of the new Lincoln set. And uh, so we have that going forward, too. In fact, this portrait is used on one of the stamps. This is an adaptation of the Matthew Brady portrait. And if you want to refresh your recollection of it at any given time, reach in your pocket and find a $5 bill. Okay. Uh, all of the materials in the exhibit that you're about to see and those on display here came into being from 1822 to 1866, which covers the period of Lincoln's mature life through the end of the year of official mourning. This is important because most topical exhibits usually use modern materials. And the challenge here was somewhat harder because you're only using materials that were contemporaneous to Lincoln. When I was young, I read a life of Lincoln condensed from Carl Sandburg's six-volume biography. It's, as a second-generation immigrant, it struck me, gee, just like Barack Obama, uh, it struck me how a man of such humble origin 
was able to become President of the United States. I began collecting Lincoln stamps. I started also collecting the story of his life and times in covers and documents. This is why my favorite covers and, le uh, and letter sheets, and many are shown here, are those of the 1860 presidential campaign. They show young Lincoln in manual labor, as a rail splitter, cutting logs to make fences, as a flat boatman, steering his barge boat down the Mississippi to New Orleans, his early occupations as farm boy, surveyor, shopkeeper, and postmaster of New Salem, Illinois, led me to suggest to the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee in 2003 that the issues for the bicentennial of his birth not just show some portraits, but show Lincoln the working man. Share with us the working Lincoln. And they did. Cheryl? Slave market. This slave market is taken from the masthead of William Lloyd Garrison's newspaper, The Abolitionist. And it was later retitled, as this one is, The Liberator. What he shows here is a real market. A major turning point in Lincoln's life was, as a flatboatman and a youngster, he was in New Orleans and he saw men, women, and children chained in slavery, being sold at the slave market and treated as less than people. He promised himself that someday, if he had the opportunity, he would work against this evil. This is probably the most heart-rending item in the whole exhibit. This is a set of real cast iron slave shackles for a child. When little boys and girls were transferred from one owner to another or brought to the market for sale, they were shackled for transfer between owners. This, this is a bank note and it's here because we're trying to show slaves at hard labor in the cotton fields and in the tobacco fields. In this case, the lady is carrying a basket bale of cotton, certainly as heavy as she is, and underfed at that. Uh, for this labor, they were often lashed by the whips of their cruel overseers. When there wasn't enough work for the slaves of a particular master, the slaves would be put out for hire to others who could use their labor. This document sets out a one-year term of hire and requires that the master renting the slave must provide one suit of winter clothing and two suits of summer clothing. Something else that's out in the exhibit that I want to call your attention to, there is a slave metal tag, square tag. It's from Charleston, South Carolina in 1828 and it actually has an individual number on it. And this was that a hired slave had to wear this like an auto license tag or they couldn't walk the streets of Charleston. This one must have been for a very trusted slave because it's imprinted servant and he had to wear it just to walk in town. The Fugitive Slave Act forced free states to hold and return escaped slaves, many of whom had used the Underground Railroad to seek freedom, such as the one young woman captured here. Conflicts over the act and whether the Kansas and Nebraska territories would be admitted as free or as slave states led to armed conflict between pro and anti-slavery vigilantes. One group of those vigilantes Oh, there were a number of slave rebellions in the U.S., the most well-known led by Nat Turner in 1831. In fact, there is a book, The Confessions of Nat Turner. Uh, the image we have here is John Brown. 
John Brown was one of the abolitionist leaders of the fighters in 1856 Kansas. In October 1859, he organized an attack on the Union Arsenal at Harper's, Ver Harper's Ferry, Virginia, now West Virginia, to seize weapons and gunpowder in an attempt to start a slave uprising. He failed. He was sentenced to hang. This picture of him is from the flyleaf of a Bible that he gave to a friend, and he's written at the bottom, Farewell, God bless you. Your friend, John Brown. I think most of us may know the song, John Brown's body lies a moldering in his grave, but his soul goes marching on. And of course, it was the soul of abolition that went marching on. Uh, by, by the way, that piece was a personal gift from Dr. Martin Luther King representing, uh, I stood up with, Miss, with Mrs. Medgar Evers, and I received that on behalf of those of us who were wounded in the first three years of the summer projects, uh, the voting projects, and she received it on behalf of her late husband, Medgar Evers, who was just honored on the U.S. civil rights set that just came out in New York, and many of our ESPER members were there for that issuance. Rail splitter. We're now going to shift from slavery to young Lincoln, and then, of course, our stories will merge. This is an 1860 presidential campaign cover. It shows the 18-year-old young Lincoln, and if we look up here next to the 1857 stamp, we can see an image of young Lincoln on his barge flatboat. They're never quite that tall, and they were a good bit longer, and he's going down the Mississippi. Under Lincoln's portrait is Lincoln as a rail splitter. This one I rather like because it's not an axe. He's showing a maul, which is a kind of hammer, and a fro, which is a wedge to split the log. And that's a lot more accurate than the usual with an axe head. So, um, Lincoln worked also as a surveyor, shopkeeper, postmaster, and almost everything else. He became a lawyer, for which I, as an attorney, make no apologies. And he practiced in Springfield, Illinois, learning from his first partner, John Todd Stewart. He was the first cousin of Mary Todd, who was Lincoln's future wife. Uh, his second partner was Stephen Logan. Each of them went into politics. Lincoln followed their lead. And he lost his first run but then he won four terms in a row as a member of the Illinois legislature. Uh, he also kept his practice going and took young William Herndon in as his junior partner. He was key in having the state capital move from the Mississippi River at Vandalia to the interior of Illinois at Springfield. He later served one term in Congress, but he was not reelected because he cast the only vote against the Mexican-American War, like the Jeanette Rawlings was the only member of Congress to vote against World War I. So he wasn't reelected, and he returned to his law practice. He was prompted to leave that law practice for another try in politics. The blue label on the right, now this is a presidential campaign cover. But the blue label on the right, it can also be found in other colors. There's a, a, a black and white one out in the exhibit, too. Was actually first used with this motto, no extension of slavery, in Lincoln's 1858 campaign to unseat Illinois U.S. Senator Stephen Douglas. Their seven debates were reprinted by the press all over the nation, and they brought Lincoln to the attention of many. In one of them, he is really noted for saying, A house divided against itself cannot stand. 
This nation cannot endure half slave, half free. It must become all one or the other. Stephen Douglas beat Lincoln, and he won his re-election in 1858. He then ran against Lincoln as the Democratic presidential candidate in 1860, but this time he lost. Lincoln was originally beardless for all but the last four years of his life. This Lincoln campaign cover with a 10 cent stamp paid cross-country postage between the West and the East. Most people's image of Lincoln came from such covers and from posters and newspapers made by artists and printers in the days before television and the Internet. Another losing opponent, Bell, joined the Confederacy and was considered a traitor. Everett, his vice presidential running mate, stayed loyal. And he gave a long, rambling speech at the dedication of the National Cemetery at Gettysburg, November 19, 1800, and the Lord gave us 63. Lincoln's much shorter Gettysburg Address has survived in our memories while Everett's is blissfully forgotten. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And then the famous last lines that we have all so well memorized. And that this government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. Breckenridge was vice president for the do-nothing president, James Buchanan, who preceded Lincoln. I'm I promise Cheryl I wouldn't get politically involved. I just can't help think of certain recent events and comparisons. I'll leave it at that. Uh, Breckenridge also lost, and his sympathies are shown on this campaign cover used with Confederate postage. A little girl saw Lincoln in the image after the election and she said, Mr. Lincoln, you'd look so much more like a president if you grew a beard. So here is Lincoln just before the inaugural. This photo was taken the very end of February uh, 1861. He was sworn in March 15th. And he's almost, you can see, you can see how it's sort of scraggly right in here. It hasn't filled in, okay? So that's his attempt. He's growing the beard. And he did. Whittemore had a very popular beardless Lincoln campaign cover. Now that's shown next to this photograph out on the exhibit. Well, he realized he needed to keep up with the times. So after Lincoln was inaugurated and the beard was full grown, Lincoln re uh, Whittemore re-engraved the plate and reissued the cover with the beard added. Lincoln had a hard time getting the best men of his day to serve in government. Many had opposed him in different ways, but all were strongly in favor of saving the Union and against slavery. He brought together this cabinet. Author Doris Kearns Goodwin, of all the books that are out there, here's one I do recommend. Author Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote a book called A Team of Rivals. It's only been out a few years, but it's well worth it. For the most part, the cabinet members did perform well and serve the country well. Unlike large government today, there were very few people or agencies to perform delicate or secret tasks for the president. 
So Lincoln had to send one of his two secretaries, Jonathan Nicolay, out to Denver to get a large amount of gold from the Denver Mint, take it by a safe and secret northerly route over to Boston to be sent to England to pay for rifle barrels being made in Manchester for the Union Army. Here is the other secretary, John Hay, writes to his colleague in Denver with some further instructions. Mary Todd, like Lincoln, was born in Kentucky, but her sometimes outspoken southern sympathies made her rather unpopular as a first lady, and it certainly wasn't for wearing short sleeves. <laughs> I, th I think the men are afraid of her biceps. She shows her conditioning. There is a cover in the exhibit, or uh, she was also rather deeply affected by the deaths of her sons, Tad and Willie, as very young boys. There is a cover in the exhibit that reminds me of a story I want to share with you about her. There was a large dinner being held at the White House, and she gave her maid, there was a receiving line, and she's shaking hands with everyone, and then she takes off her, and she gives her maid her white silk gloves. The maid gives her a fresh set to put on for dinner. She goes to dinner. In the middle of dinner, oh my lord, she gets a gravy stain on a finger. So she calls her maid over and sends her up for another pair of gloves. Lincoln rose angrily, and in a rare display of public anger, recorded by a New York Herald editor who happened to be invited to the dinner and overheard it, happily recorded it but didn't publish it. Lincoln turns to her and says, Madam, this nation is engaged in a great war whose cost in lives and funds has hurt us very deeply. Your frippery with gloves has an expense that this nation and this president will not tolerate. <laughs> the cover in the exhibit is one in which she sent her personal check from her personal front funds to Fuller Brothers of New York for 48 pairs of white silk gloves. <laughs> Just after Lincoln's election, the southern states start seceding from the Union. First there were seven, as shown on this early version with a flag, and later 11 formed the Confederate States of America. On April 12, 1861, Five weeks after Lincoln's inauguration, Confederate troops attacked and captured Fort Sumter, South Carolina, beginning the Civil War. While it's clothed in the language of the rights of states to set their own laws and economics, it was really slavery and the fear of its abolition that was the basic cause of the South starting the Civil War. The Confederate States of America elected Jefferson Davis, their president. Remember what I said earlier about, about images and getting them out to people? So this patriotic envelope and this stamp bore the image of Jefferson Davis. And that was to promote his image as president in the Confederacy. The Union feared that the rebels might make use of the postage stamps that were in their possession. So the Post Office Department declared the 1851 and 1857 stamp issues to be no longer valid for postage. A whole new series was issued in 1861, replacing the old ones from June that year and thereafter. Here is a cover that says, old stamp no good and you see the old one has been struck through with an X while the new 1861 three cent was accepted for postage there was a shortage of metals in the Union 
to make coins because so many had been taken in for war supplies. I'm sorry, Dave, he's in the business of coins, but they were actually turning them into bullet casings and things like that. So they're, it helps the values. There's somewhat fewer around. For a while, small change was made by printing stamp currency in low values up to the 50 cent. And there are some examples seen out there. We should remember that at this time, 50 cents was a day's wage for many laborers. This cover shows Lincoln's free frank. That's where one can send a letter just by signing his or her name. And it was on April 21, 1863, to General Sanford. He was commanding the New York City garrison. The letter provided Stanford, Sanford with instructions on how to handle the mail seized from ships that were caught trying to evade the blockade. Now that blockade of the East Coast was led by the Southern Atlantic Squadron, commanded by Admiral Richard Lee. Ironically, stopping the supplies from reaching his brother, Confederate States Commander Robert E. Lee. They were on opposite sides. Oh, this is a favorite, Lincoln Medicine. Uh, there's an awful lot to be appreciated about this cover, but we'll just focus on a few points. Uh, Lincoln is shown as mixing medicines to cure the Union's ills and attack the rebels. And two of the signs read, Lincoln's renowned rebel exterminator, warranted not to spoil in warm climates. The other one I like right down at the bottom is pure, refined, national elixir of liberty. The postmaster of Gouverneur, New York, an upstate town, hand-carved an image of old Abe on wood to cancel the stamps on his town's mail. Union spirit was shown in many different patriotic covers, and we're only showing a couple examples here. There's loads of colorful ones right out there. And they sought to inspire people to keep their union spirit high. It could hardly go any higher than one showing Lincoln as the Comet of the North. The Magnus Company prepared many covers featuring Lincoln, coupled with his often underperforming generals in the East. Here's General Halleck. They also did Generals Scott, McClellan and Fremont, none of whom was aggressive enough against the Confederates as Sherman and Sheridan were later. In fact, Lincoln once said, if General McClellan is not presently using the Army of the Potomac, I have a use for them. <laughs> However, in the West, a young general mounted a successful land and river campaign from St. Louis south and New Orleans north along the Mississippi. And he won a stunning victory at Shiloh, Shiloh, Tennessee. General Grant successfully split the Confederacy, controlled the river, and while the Gulf of Mexico was blockaded, this had the effect of cutting access to any foreign supplies and materials, and it isolated Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas from the rest of the Confederacy. Lincoln thought about it, realized he had a good one, and he put Grant in charge of the entire army. Captured soldiers of both sides were held at prisons with poor sanitation, poor medical care, and even worse food. But there was mail exchanged under flags of truce, especially at Old Point Comfort, Virginia shown on this scarce cover, where stamps of both the Confederacy and the Union paid postage in each of their respective territories. Frederick Douglass, freed slave, was the first black to ever become an advisor to any U.S. president, although I must note in passing something that I know many of my black friends here are probably not aware of. 
the first poet laureate of the United States, named by George Washington, was Phyllis Wheatley, a freed slave woman who had been educated in England and then returned to New England. And he named her first poet laureate. In any event, Mr. Lincoln recognized the value of Frederick Douglass' advice. One of Douglass' strong suggestions to Lincoln was that he add to the Union Army the strength of able and courageous free black men who were willing to serve as soldiers for the Union. Lincoln took Douglas' advice and he created regiments of black soldiers with white officers and they were known as the U.S. Colored Troops. Here on this envelope, which is out there, he approved the appointment of the first colonel of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. A black soldier dressed in a Zouave uniform, they were inspired by Turkish military uniforms, is the only, only found on one patriotic, and I'm sorry to say it's the only example known today, but at least it's there for you to see. Their bravery was brought to the attention of most modern Americans in a movie that if you haven't seen it, please do rent it, Denzel Washington, in the movie Glory. Many soldiers' families needed help while their men were away at war. This cover carried aid coupons to help a soldier's family pay for food. On September 22, 1862, Lincoln used his commander-in-chief powers to order an end to slavery in all the states which were in open rebellion, effective January 1, 1863. Uh, here is the Emancipation Proclamation is issued as a general order to all Union troops. The war was fought in open fields, and it was fought in wooded forests and on the seas. The Marines in this hand-tinted Magnus cover were fighting in the woods of North Carolina. John Erickson's improved propeller and Dahlgren's more powerful cannons enabled the Union uh, ironclad Monitor, which is right here. It was described probably accurately as looking like a cheese box on a raft. <laughs> In any event, while it only had two guns, they were more powerful than the ones in the CSS, or Confederate steamship, Virginia, and it beat the Virginia. Now, you might have known it as the Merrimack. That was its older name. So this is the famous Battle of the Monitor and the Merrimack. And the effect of it was that it secured for the Union the Virginia Capes and Chesapeake Bay, an important gain in the war. Lincoln ran for re-election in 1864. He took a border state Democrat, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, as his vice presidential running mate on the Union Party ticket. He was looking for help to bring the nation back together and to start its reconstruction after the anticipated end of the war within a year. John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth was the brother of renowned actor Edwin Booth. He thought that he could stop the South's loss of the war if Lincoln and Secretary of War Stanton were killed. What might have succeeded in 1862 or 3 was a foolish act of desperation after Lee already surrendered the Confederate Army at Appomattox on April 9, 1865. Nevertheless, Booth shot Lincoln on April 14, 1865, while he and his wife were at a performance of My American Cousin at Ford's Theater, not far from here. He died at 7.20 a.m. the next morning. The nation went into a period of deep mourning. This mourning cover, of which there are many, many different examples, has handwritten references on it, 
where the sender wants to remind the receiver about Ford's theater and the betrayal. At this time, it was customary to observe a one-year period of mourning, and many people wore elaborate ribbons as memorials. And you'll see a number out there, you know, there's a couple out there that are on paper, but this one is hand-painted on silk. Almost at the end of the mourning year, Congress belatedly gave Mrs. Lincoln the right given other widows of presidents to free Frank her mail by just signing her name. This morning cover, dated April 10, 1866, is the first known use of her franking privilege. The National Banknote Company created a portrait of Lincoln from his preferred C.S. German photograph with some elements of one by Matthew Brady. The U.S. Treasury commissioned National to prepare an official mourning portrait, which could then be distributed throughout the country to people who requested it, starting with the anniversary of what would have been Lincoln's 57th birthday, February 12, 1866. The U.S. Post Office Department adapted the same portrait for use as a 15-cent stamp in the morning cover of black, actually they considered blue, but rejected it. And it was to pay the common treaty rates to German states and to France. It was issued in April 1866, marking the end of the official year of mourning. The stamp and its first use on cover is shown. I want to thank my daughter, Susan Landau Van Dyke, for assisting and providing the imaging here and the presentation, which her dinosaur dad doesn't have the modern computer skills to achieve. Uh, I also want to thank David Phillips of North Miami Beach, Florida, and uh, Dana and Barbara Linnett uh, of Early American History Auctions in the West, and so many others, because of the oftentimes they went to really put themselves out to help put together the pieces here. In fact, the Frederick Douglass photo arrived less than five days before we shipped the exhibit off to the museum so I could quickly rework that one page. And for that, we owe Dana Lennett a great thanks. Um, I also want to thank my wife, Eileen, for all of her years of forbearance, 43 of them. Um, here are some, we're going to leave this, this image up for a while, so for anybody who wants to refer to these, these are some further references if you want to get them down. Uh, I will make one observation, in addition to the websites referred to here, uh, this article of mine, the Lincoln story from the 2002 American Philatelist, uh, if you go to stamps.org, which is the American Philatelic Society site. That's currently up. Uh, they have recycled it, as it were, uh, because it fits in. I just did another article for them on Lincoln Philately, and uh, that's up. This marks the end of our lecture. It's not the end of your experience. Esper has a table where some of our members, and in fact at this point, now that we're no longer so formal, I am a member of ESPER and very proud of it. <laughs> we have a table outside. Uh, you don't have to be black to share and enjoy the triumphs and the tragedies of the black experience in America. Every ethnic group has its history and we are all the richer for learning more and more about it. In addition to the full 160 page 10 frame exhibit, there are two short exhibits. One is a single frame, uh, 16 pages, and it shows the centennial of the centennial, including such everyday available things as Frank, as Teddy Roosevelt's, um, Teddy Roosevelt's telegram 
to the sculptor's widow, Mrs. Augusta St. Gaudens, asking for permission to use a bust for featuring on the stamp. And Mrs. St. Gaudens' original letter in which she replies, please, I'd feel very honored. Uh, and other things related to that. The other exhibit shows some of the wide variety of Lincoln material that can be collected, and most of it on a reasonably low budget. Appreciate the first page, but get excited by the other 15. The first page are the classics, and many of them are more expensive, as you might guess. But there's an awful lot of ways to collect Lincoln on a reasonable and low budget. Uh, the Scott Company has generously made available to us many copies of the February 2009 Scott Stamp Monthly with an article by me called Collecting Lincoln. And it gives tips and ideas on areas of Lincoln philately that are open for collecting. And that exhibit shows a few more, a few more excuse me, that weren't in the article. Uh, most of the items pictured in the article are actually in that frame if you want to see them in person. And thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> Sir? In the uh, 60s, when I was in college, there was a group called the Lincoln Society of Philadelphia. I lost track of it. Know anything about that? So did I, and I miss them. <laughs> I have all of their publications. Uh, I worked with a few people once to try and revive it, and I'm actually working on a book, which I hope to have done at, by 2012. I've been work it takes quite a while. Uh, and it's going to be Lincoln Philately. Uh, I'm hopeful that that might provide a spur to revival. I tried to do something in conjunction with the bicentennial, but most of the members of the society are long gone. So I'm sure that, you know, if we can do something to revive it, we'd love to. Um, I just might mention, for any of you who, I, I, I've been very fortunate in my collecting that I was able to serve as mentor. One of the good things about being involved in collecting is to mentor others. Uh, that's a major thing that we do with the American Philatelic Society, with Esper, the Classic Society. We teach other people, we share with them. So that you don't have to come in with all the knowledge of the world full blown in your head. We'd be happy to share, we'd be happy to teach. And one of the things is there's going to be an auction shortly conducted by Spink of the William Ainsworth collection. Bill was a protege of mine, uh, and he, has, it'll be in uh, April, and it's really a very strong exhibit. Even if you aren't going to collect the classics, but you appreciate them up through some more modern material, it's worth, it's going to be worth having for the reference. Uh, and another one of my protégés, Irv Heimberger, uh, has done very well with his exhibits. And, you know, it's one of those situations where the people you're mentoring have bigger budgets than their, uh, <laughs> than their mentor, uh, and they've been able to acquire some of the great rarities that I really couldn't afford. But I found a few nice things along the way. So, but it, it's, you'll, you'll find a ready reception at any level of philately. Local clubs all the way on up. Any other questions? What gentleman back here? Uh, in reference to slavery, what is the accuracy of the Willie Lynch uh, letter to create a slave? I, I'm aware of controversy on it. Um, I think that's a little more complicated than we could address here today. I'm of the belief that it probably is, is valid, but, you know, in terms of going to the research and the trouble to prove it, no. I, I wouldn't dare that. Uh, I have a degree in history. I dusted it off just enough. Maybe not quite that much. Um, there is a letter that's been written about the bad experience and the problems of slavery. 
and there's some question as to whether the person who wrote the letter had actually experienced uh, the events or whether it had been written third hand from other people's accounts. Is that accurate, sir? Yes, thank you. Okay, I saw a couple other hands. There's one right here. You're not a shill? <laughs> uh, actually, I won the Nineken Medal for that research. Uh, there is an article that was published in two parts, the February and May issues of 2000 of the Chronicle of the U.S. Philatelic Classic Society. Is that a good enough uh, commercial, Ken? Okay. Uh, and in that article, I set forth all of the details we've been able to put together that that really is the memorial stamp for Lincoln, and that's how it was intended. Uh, I must say, so that you understand, when I talk about there being a lot of resources available to you, um, before Dr. Gantz became the chief curator of philately, she was preceded by a dear friend of many of us, Wilson Hume. And Wilson had gone into the museum's collection and the ones he had copied earlier of the Travers papers. And he was able to help me detail that story. And all the documentation and everything you're looking for is reported there. And then I condensed it into a piece that appeared in First Days, the Journal of the American First Day Cover Society, and spoke of the 15 cent as America's first commemorative. So you'll find your references dated 2002 in those two sources. You're welcome, sir. And yes, I do think it definitely is. Yes, sir. Some people believe that Lincoln was not the great emancipator and that the Emancipation Proclamation stretched Lincoln's wartime powers as a president too far going outside his legal jurisdiction. So what are your <coughs> personal and history-based views on this issue? Yes. <laughs> or as I used to say to some of my students that there were pros and cons, I'd say, yes. <laughs> um, yes and no. First of all, I think we have to understand that Lincoln was not originally in favor of emancipation. Uh, one of the things that I show in the exhibit, but it's not worth much because he only dealt with it for a few years, was that he flirted with the African Colonization Society. This was a society that believed that the best thing to do with people who were freed from slavery was to return them where they came from. And since the vast majority came from the west coast of Africa, they established a place for them called Liberia. And if you look at the Liberian flag, it'll tell you the story right away. There's 13 red and white stripes and a single white star. Now, and the capital is Monrovia for President Monroe. And he actually considered this for a while. As far as exceeding his authority, um, I, I have to be careful here because I'm a former professor of constitutional law. We could spend the next three hours on this. And you don't want that. <laughs> uh, what there is is this. And this also goes to uh, Lincoln's problems with his abuse, frankly it was abuse, of the writ of habeas corpus during the war. Um, if you want to track down a reference, see the U.S. Supreme Court decision ex parte Milligan, M-I-L-L-I-G-A-N. Uh, essentially what happened is when the war was safely over, they told Lincoln, you exceeded your authority. Okay. Uh, it's, it's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like um, ex parte Komatsu. Uh, 
where a dead Franklin Roosevelt is told by the Supreme Court, you shouldn't have taken all these loyal Japanese citizens and stuffed them into desert-located internment camps. This was wrong. Um, but of course it was over. Congress eventually voted some funds for the people who had been deprived that way. Uh, did he have the authority? I tend to think that he did not have it on the habeas corpus because the Constitution is very, very explicit on what you can or can't do in habeas corpus. Could he do it in, could he do it with regard to the slaves? We hadn't adopted the 14th Amendment yet. There was no provision that said, nor may Congress deprive, and it wasn't Congress, it was the President actually, nor may Congress deprive people of property, because remember the Southern view is slaves are property, not people. Uh, the word in law is chattel. Comes from the same source as cattle. Uh, and I didn't, I wasn't going to get into the detail, but I'll say this much about it was one of the real sad parts of the history of slavery is how many cold-hearted southern owners purposely had sexual relations with their women slaves in order to create more slaves. And they knew what they were doing. Uh, this is my father's coloring. I am. He was not that olive. I don't know. But no. No. He he was he was tawny colored, but so would every pasty faced honky in the room who worked out under the sun all the time. Uh, I have many good friends who are Chinese, you know, and you can see many people from China with very, very pale complexions. You see others with very golden complexions. Generally, their families came from further south where that was a good adaptive trait. So, it, let's be frank. Skin color is not a be-all and end-all. Okay. But the campaign, the Lincoln activist, was it for his relationship to what he was trying to you're, do? Now you're coming <coughs> Lincoln was called an Africanist, one, because he spoke in favor of the Liberian alternative early, but then he abandoned that. Secondly, because he stood up for the cause of people from Africa living in the United States. And for that reason, he was called the Africanist. This has as much, the, the mixed blood story has as much validity um, when, I, when I published this story. Uh, some extremist attacked me because didn't wasn't I aware that when Lincoln was out riding circuit as a lawyer, he and Judge Davis and others often shared a bed. Well, yeah, that was the style at the time. There weren't a lot of beds, and men would share a bed because if an inn has five beds, and 11 people to accommodate. Whoever was number 11 and drew the short straw slept on the floor, and two others would share a bed. Well, I was accused of trying to hide Lincoln's homosexual past. <coughs> um, it's, you know, there are so many stories that can be invented after the fact. Uh, that, too, was untrue. So. Questions at this point, but that means we get to continue questions out with food in the coffee. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs>